Spas Motors, the Gambia's largest auto sales and service center, has great deals on new model Ford Ranger, Great Walls Wingo 5, Sherry Mogos Tigo 7, and QQ. The all-new 2019 Ford Ranger has been developed and tested to the demanding standards of built Ford Tough. This double cabin pickup is the ultimate construction and fieldwork pickup vehicle. It has four cylinders, air conditioning, six-speed gearbox, 2.2-liter diesel engine, reinforced shock absorbers, and comes in manual or automatic and has a ground clearance of 235 millimeters. Great Wall Motors Wingo 5 double cabin pickup is the result of great achievement and development by Great Wall. The new Wingo 5 has leather seats, reverse sensors, four cylinders, CD player, MP3 port, centralized air conditioning, and a 2.8-liter engine. The new Sherry Tigo 7 is the latest addition to the Sherry lineup. The all-new compact SUV boasts dynamic style and comfort coupled with best-in-class safety and technical features. The sporty Tigo 7 comes fully loaded with sunroof, Bluetooth connectivity, 360-degree angle cameras, reverse camera screen, reverse sensors, six-speed automatic gearbox, and only four-cylinders petrol engine. The 2019 Sherry Motors QQ is one of the biggest selling mini cars in the world. It is a four-cylinder saloon car that is both economic to run and perfect for everyday errands. Stop by the Espace Motors showroom today on the Bertel Harding Highway and test drive any of our new vehicles. Call our sales team on 333-743-353-2222 or 352-2222 and book an appointment. Espace Motors, driving comfort and safety. <laughs> it's happy time. Get 50% off all calls to any network. Enjoy calls every day to any network from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Is it too good to be true? <laughs> QCell. We innovate, others follow. Remember this. Breeze move at the corner, kick it up, TT! And it is over! And this. Lights, camera, action. And even this. Fusel had you covered then, and we still do now. With Q Football, you can get the latest updates of your favorite teams in international leagues and championships. Simply send your team's name to 411 to get their latest updates. To get instant real-time updates for a whole month, send your team's name to 511. With Q Football, you know what's happening even if you're not watching. QSL, we innovate, orders follow. Would you like to expand your business or start a new business? We have a solution for you. Step up and take advantage of an opportunity with Q Money. Be a Q Power agent with Q Money and earn income from transaction commissions. As a Q Power agent, you get free training and support, and you could also be an employer. Q Money is a solution to become successful. Be engaged. Be a Q Power agent. For more information, Visit qmoney.gm or call 3100218 or 3333291. You can also send us an email to newagent at qmoney.gm. Padding on, for you, Julio Tiban, or Lela Stokela Julian in Safaro Le Yuan. A Chabo Vendor Level, Q Money, or Lake Udima Basambalena. Take Q Money Juloti, and in Q Money La Sidola, and this is a Lang Council. Ni kata Q Money Juloti ibe karandila anung ise dema wakang. Q Money puru Allah nyato ta wato mbadiyo ke Q Money Juloti. Kaku makoi sote nyingu wato isita na website wato www.qmoney.gm wala isen kumandi nyingu telephone number wato 3100218 wala yeng kumandi nyingu number wato 33 333291 
Jumon, Dinel la jungle, Bado Jum, Dinel la japale, Basa Heldal. Nga buga teki, Fena rek jay jar, Fofu nono sa kiu mani. Nga jay kati kiu power dong, Pour am si lula ler, Deng nyo kol si 3100218, Wala, 3333291, Wala nga guest you, Si www. Qmoney.gm. Voilà, bête et boule hardy. Gagnez ton nouveau focus et new agent at Qmoney.gm. Want more in your bundle at QCell, the biggest, fastest, and most reliable mobile operator. We've got you covered with Sunyu Bundle. With Sunyu Bundle, dial star 303 has and get the bundle of your choice. Sunyu Bundle, affordable. More in your bundle at QCell, the biggest, fastest, and most reliable mobile operator. We've got you covered with Sunyu Bundle. With Sunyu Bundle, dial star 303 has and get the bundle of your choice. Sunyu Bundle. Affordable, fast and reliable. Q-Cell. few commissioners not around so we're just waiting to get the courtroom before we get started oh, thank you mate. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to this morning's uh, proceedings. Uh, may I ask um, uh, Imam to um, give us a, I offer some prayers, please. Oh, we love him in a seat and Rahim, similar Rahman Rahim, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Rahman Rahim, Maliki, Omidin, Iyak, and now do a Iyak and a star in Idin Nasra, Al Musa, Masra, the Lizin, and Amta Alim. غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين وإن تستفتيه فقد جاءكم الفتح نصر من الله وفتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلل ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الفلق من صار ما خلق ومن صار قاشق إجا وقبا ومن صار نفاثة في الأقدي ومن صار حاسد إجا حسد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس من شر وسواس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين شكرا إمام سي Thank you very much إمام for those prayers Counselor are we ready with uh, this morning's witness. Uh, yeah, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Good morning, all. Uh, we are ready to proceed. The witness is in the waiting room. May I kindly ask the officer to bring in the witness, please.
I lamin kababajo. I lamin kababajo. Do swear that. Do swear that. I'll speak the truth. I'll speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the, the truth. So help me. So help me God. Good morning, Mr. Bajo. Good morning. Uh, welcome Sorry. to the TRRC. Thank you, sir. Um, we have met a few times. Uh, my name is Esafa. Um, my responsibility is to lead you through your evidence before this commission. Um, as I mentioned to you previously, uh, this is not a criminal trial. This is a fact-finding mission, and with the objective of trying to establish the truth about what happened uh, during the Jame regime in the 22-year the rule of the uh, Jame. We have warned quite a number of the witnesses who appear before this commission that um, it's a criminal offense under the laws of this country to lie on the oath. It is also a criminal offense to give false testimony before the TRRC. Um, you would agree with me that uh, you've been given that information? Yes, you did, did Council. Um, so, not that I have any reason to doubt that your testimony today would be truthful, uh, but I would just is to underline that and encourage uh, truthfulness in the evidence that you give. I do that to the best of my ability. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Witness. So uh, let's start with the formalities. What are your full names? My full names are Lamin Kaba Bajo. What is your date of birth? 10th November 1964. Can you briefly uh, give us uh, your information regarding your educational background. I went to Brikama Primary School from 1972 to 78 and then to Muslim High School 1978 to 1983 and then later in 2009 to 2012 I obtained a master's degree in diplomatic studies from Leicester University. Which university? Leicester. Leicester. Uh, Leicester in England, right? Yes, it Council. Wonderful. Um, so, what did you do when you finished high school? In April 1984, I joined the then Gambia National Gendarmerie. And uh, where did you do your training? At the Fajara Barracks. Uh, what, when did you complete your training? It was a four-month training from April, uh, I assume, by July, August. And uh, what happened to your career when you finished your recruit training? After finishing the recruit training in those days, because we, that is basic uh, police training, and then we proceed to what we call the uh, Zanamori specific uh, special Zanamori training, then to become a Zanamori officer in those days. Uh, we all know the Zanamori was alien in uh, Anglophone countries. And then we had to do uh, extra uh, training, five months training. Uh, but when we passed out, I was posted to the admin office as the chief clerk. And at the same time, I was attending this five-month training course at the Zandarmeri headquarters. Ultimately, you became a Zandarmeri, or, or, or yes, as they as they called it at the time, you became a Zandarmeri or a, a Zandam. A Zandam, certainly. And that's right. And uh, what rank did you attain when you finished the training? Uh, when we finished the training, we naturally we got the first class. Uh, we call it Lance Corporal. And then as we pro progress, uh, I was promoted to a sergeant. Later, I started to the uh, cadet officer's selection examination, and I was lucky to, to pass. Uh, this was 87. 
and then I was promoted among other five other uh, colleagues. Uh, this was 1987. And from there, in some time in 89, uh, I was promoted to a uh, second lieutenant. And in the, uh, I think it was 89, I wouldn't remember the days specifically, uh, unless I can refer to my CV, but I have the days uh, if I could remember from second lieutenant, I was also promoted to a lieutenant. And then in 1992, I went to Morocco to do the gendarmerie of course, course, uh, one year. And then when I returned, um, one, uh, the following year, I was promoted to a captain. But in 19, 1990, I was posted to the then presidential guards uh, as a third in command. Uh, before that, I was uh, command of the military police, briefly and also Deputy Commander of the then Mobile Gendarmerie. Uh, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, you became a cadet officer in 1987. Yes, 87. And uh, you went for training in 1992. Yes, so yes, yes, During that five-year period, did you have the opportunity to go for overseas training? No, I did not. Were you happy with that situation? Uh, not at all, Nitkas, not at all. Mr. Badger, you can leave the microphone on. You can also draw it closer to you so that you don't have to be going kneeling, uh, leaning forward all the time. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, but take the posture that makes you uh, feel most I'm comfortable. Fine. I'm fine. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, in five years, since you became a cadet officer, you did not have the time or the chance, the opportunity to go for overseas training? Not at all, Lord Council. Was that normal? Very abnormal. And you were not happy with the situation? No, I wasn't happy. Uh, but in 1992, according to your testimony, you went to Morocco? Yes, Lord Council. Can you tell us how that happened? Maybe before that, I just want to give you some little more information about this, because this five-year period was very important for us. As a young man, he joined the service, and we all know the perception of you know, uh, somebody coming from high school going to the service in those days. Uh, and then after doing your best, uh, excelling in all the examinations and tests. Um, but the, the handicap there was, uh, the excuse then was because the Zandamori was uh, a Francophone thing, Though I had my, uh, I had a uh, credit in French from high school, and I, I myself, among other colleagues, were enlisted to the Alliance Franco, uh, how do you call it, Alliance Frances in those days, uh, and later to the Ecole Frances in Fajara, where we are pursuing, you know, French courses to prepare us for the course. But then it was his Senegal, it was his time of the Confederation. At the time, the only opportunities uh, were to either go to Senegal or you go to France. Uh, the French were given scholarships, uh, but because of the Confederation, they will give two or three slots for Senegambia. And then I remember myself and some of my colleagues went to Dakar on two occasions uh, to sit to the selection exam with uh, some Senegalese officials who also aspire to go for the training. Uh, you can see with our basic, our uh, all level French and a little bit of uh, training in Alas Franco, you cannot compete. I remember one of our tests, we had somebody who was already, uh, a, is already a magistrate, and that really was a handicap. Uh, so we couldn't, we couldn't, we, okay, we couldn't really succeed in that. Uh, the only other opportunity that came was uh, when there were uh, vacancies to go to, to, to Senegal, to chess, to do a two-year two basic military course. And then uh, a selection process was launched. Uh, some of us ap applied and we started the exams, uh, but unfortunately, we had people who were more competent in French than us at the time, and they succeeded. Those were that, that were the trio, uh, Alassane Okoyate, now with the police, uh, retired Captain Demanjai, and then former Minister Osman Baji. Uh, Demanjai, fortunately, has gone up to university in Dakar, doing French. Okoyate, though, at all level level, but he was still better than us in, in French. 
Usman Bayi was brought directly from the Brittany military, a military, that is the military school in Senegal, where he did all his high school. So really we couldn't, <laughs> so that was the misfortune. Uh, to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, essentially, for you as a Zandam cadet, opportunities for overseas training was very, very limited. Very limited at the time, very limited. Before the talkies came, it was yeah. very limited. But eventually, you were able to get a scholarship. Kindly tell us how you managed to get that scholarship. Actually, that scholarship didn't come in my name. <coughs> it came in Yaya Jame's name, Yaya Jame, the former president. And I wasn't even aware of it. Then I was at the president's cell guards, and he was with the military police. Uh, this was shortly after the amalgamation, and they were transitioning. Some of them who opted to go into the army, uh, they were transitioning. We, uh, who some of us, you know, we had to go to the police because the presidential guards was under the TSG and uh, uh, unless you want to move but we had to stay with the police and then when he got win of this he was warned that he was supposed to go to Morocco for the cause and he said no that was not good that was not meant f it's not for him uh, essentially yeah Jami had this scholarship to go for overseas training to Morocco he refused to take that scholarship because he thought it was not in his best interest. Certainly. That's what you're telling us. That's what you're telling us. Certainly, because okay. he said, uh, now he's in the army, going for a gendarmerie officer training would not be beneficial to him. And then, because we are colleagues, we have the same badge, we enlisted the same day, and then I'll call him a friend, uh, not only a colleague at the time. And then he came and you know, hinted me of this, and he told me, you know, in, in the local language, so doff doff will be a misli, do them at cost. When you talk for five years, when you know them, and in North Sally was telling me if you if you if you if 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 you do not not follow this matter you will lose this and if you don't lose you will not go for a course again because it has been five years since we didn't have the chance to go and do the course so you have to follow it so that you go. That was a huge favor from Yaya Jami. Indeed. Ah, maybe I wouldn't call it a favor. I wouldn't call it a favor. Maybe I don't think I don't I don't think I say favor. You will not but call it. You, you will not call it a favor. Uh, no, I don't think we are colleagues. We are colleagues, so I don't think maybe. Were you the only one to whom that call scholarship could have gone to? At the time, in terms of seniority. No, yeah. the question is were you the only one to whom that scholarship could have gone to? Not at all, not at all. No. Yeah, Jamie could have kept quiet. Yes, he could. Uh, he did not have to do anything for you to get that. Mm -hmm. Yes, he could. So, therefore, by telling you and encouraging you to take steps to get it, he was doing you a favor. Okay, I, I accept it. I you accept, accept he was giving, yes. doing yeah. you a favor. Yeah. Good. yeah. And in fact, <coughs> you saw Yaya Jami as your brother. Yes. You, you were class, as they call it. Yes. You, you enlisted on the same day. Yes. Okay. Good. Apart from Yaya Jami telling you about this scholarship and reminding you of the fact that you've been languishing there for five years without any training, overseas training opportunity, now here is one. He is going to give it up for you. You have to fight to get it. Uh, what else did he do for I, you to get it? He didn't stop there. I remember one occasion at the airport. He even had to you know, convince me because I'm somebody who also wouldn't really fight for things. I, Left to me alone, I only take what comes my way, the right way. So I don't want, I'm not, I'm not that type. But he knows that in me. Uh, and then he asked me, the commander, I said, let's go and see the commander so that we can tell him then at the airport. So, so, so you are not the f type to fight for anything? No, no. So, no. but Yaya Jame came in and trusted himself into this particular issue. And he fought yeah. for you. Yes. Pretty much. Yes. Uh, so, uh, who was this Momo Dunjai at the time? What position did he occupy? He was the commander of the gendarmerie at the time. Really, he's late now. So, uh, Yaya Jami approached the commander of the gendarmerie mm -hmm. and argued your case to get that scholarship? Yes. You would not have done that yourself? No, I wouldn't have gone that far. So, he put out his neck to argue this for you? Correct? Yeah, yeah that, 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 that's how he was, he used to be also. That was also a favor, wasn't it? 
Uh, yeah, okay, I'll take it. Yeah, it's a favor. Okay. Uh, what else happened after that? Then from there, there was a day also we came to the state house. Okay, when the commander promised, in fact, com commander said, we cannot change it, you have to go. And he told him in his face that we lose it, Gambia will lose it, but I wouldn't go because I don't need the cost. I'm in, in a different uh, setup now, and then taking the cost would mean that I will just uh, deny somebody of a chance who would have uh, needed, needed it. And then, but the late uh, commander said, no, we will not change it, we have to prepare and go. And they had a little bit of achievement there, and then we left. Mr. Mr. Bajo, can you speak a little bit sorry. slowly? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Thank that's you my, very much. That's my anyway, I'll try. And then he argued. Um, and then from there, one day he came to the uh, he came to State House. I don't know for what mission, but he came to my office and told me, look, how, how about this course? They uh, did not give it to me. I said, uh, I said no. He said, no. Why can't we go to this SG? Then we go and uh, talk to him. That was Sarah Jang Haden. Uh, you mean, by SG, you mean? Uh, Sarah Jang what position did he, he hold? He was a secretary general. So, so of, of yeah, Jame proposed that you and him go to the secretary general, mm -hmm. that was the head of the civil service, yes. to argue your case yes. who, as to why you should be given the scholarship. Yes. That was huge, wasn't it? It was, it was. And this was the head of the civil service? Yes. So, and Yaya had to go and argue your case for you to get the scholarship? Yes. This is another huge favor. Yes. Um, thank you. And uh, did you ultimately get the scholarship? Yes, ultimately it was uh, given to me. Well, you would agree with me that <coughs> without Yaya Jame's intervention, it would have been virtually impossible? Yes, almost. I would have gone that far. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, you went for overseas training uh, and then you came back. So tell us what happened. Uh, after you came back, when you came back, and uh, which positions you occupied? Yeah, when I, before I left, I was uh, already number two, because the, when I went to State House in 1990, uh, the late Major Njai was the commander, uh, but later he was moved to, to, the, to take over as the commander of the gendarmerie, and then through Jaune, uh, became the commander, and I subsequently became his deputy. Turo Jaune became the commander yes, of what? Of the presidential guards then. All right, thank you. Proceed, please. And then uh, when I returned, uh, when I was, on during the course, I was still number two. Uh, and then the Lieutenant Demanjai was number three at the time. So when I returned uh, sometime in 1993, after the one-year uh, course in Morocco. S slowly, uh, slowly, slowly, slowly. <laughs> and then Turo Jaune also was redeployed back to the gendarmerie, where he assumed as a commander. And then I became, I was promoted and appointed the commander of the presidential guards in January 1994. And uh, what, were, what were your responsibilities as commander of the presidential guards? Uh, the, com the responsibilities or the core responsibilities are the protection of the passing of the head of state, the president, and his family and the premises, their premises, that's where they live and they, by extension the other, uh, the, his other personal property that used to be on the Faja, Faja, uh, Atlantic Boulevard. In 1994, you were commander of the presidential guards. Uh, would this responsibility involve you having to travel with the president whenever he left the country? Yes, it does. During uh, 1994, did you have occasion, say for instance in say June 1994, did you have occasion to travel out of the country with the president? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Now we traveled to the OAU summit in Tunisia and from the, from the summit uh, we, we uh, proceeded to the United Kingdom where the president took his uh, annual leave where we stayed with him. Uh, during that period, while you were in England, did you hear about events that were to happen in the country, to happen in the country during that period? Yes, I had a rumor of uh, a coup being planned against the government. Can you provide the details of that rumor, please? Yeah, it was when I was in in. In UK with the president, I was there with my immediate deputy, that was Dembanjai, Lieutenant Dembanjai. 
and then the co officer in charge uh, on the grounds was uh, Lieutenant Lantom Bontamba at the time. And because we normally have these uh, f frequent uh, uh, briefings by telephone calls here and there. Or, or then particularly, he informed me of the, the rumors, rumors circulating <laughs> uh, that there were some um, soldiers within the army who were planning a coup. So this was official information being passed on to you by your deputy who was on the ground and your deputy at the time was Lieutenant Langtombong Tamba. Yeah. That's, 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 that's what you just said, right? Yeah, second deputy. He was the one on the ground. Actually. That's right. <coughs> and uh, the information was that some army officers were planning a coup d'etat. Uh, did he mention any names? No, not at all. Uh, did you pass on that information to the president? No, I didn't. Why didn't you? No, because it was too early. That was, that was going to be very unprofessional at the time. Because the office, uh, a unit of the country that's responsible for internal security. And I think they would have, and the assurance I got from him was that the NSS, the, the NSS were already aware, and then they were handling the matter. So they would have processed it, and then the information would further come into an intelligence, and they would know when to then there, they would even inform me before I go directly to the president. So you did not deem the information important enough to pass it on to the president? It is important, but it would have been premature at the time. That would have been a mere information because we had had several of the, uh, such information flowing all over uh, within, during that period. So there, were, there were frequent rumors of coup? Certainly. Okay. On this particular occasion, did you treat it seriously? No, it was an information at the time, unless it develops into a, uh, intelligence and then some, some behavior, but I didn't, I didn't go that far. But the mere fact that the, the, I was assured that the, the intelligence uh, department service were in the picture and they were handling processing the inform information. So I didn't did, think, uh, did you take it seriously? I would. Any, any word of a coup <coughs> would be taken seriously. Uh, I just have your statement here. Uh, Mr. Bag, you have a copy, don't you? Yeah, I, I have uh, could you could you take a look at it? Uh, that's your own copy, right? Yes. Um, can you look at uh, paragraph nine? Is it? <coughs> but. <coughs> Yes. Just wait a moment. You just said a moment ago that uh, rumors of a coup, anybody would take it seriously. Yes. Uh, and uh, because it, that is because of the importance of it. Yes. So it would have to be taken seriously. Yes. Uh, not taking it seriously would basically amount to a dereliction of duty within it for yes. senior officers. Yes. Uh, could you take a look at uh, your statement, please? Pa paragraph 9. And uh, read that paragraph out to me. In 1994, I went with President Sadao Rajawara to OAU summit in Tunisia. After the summit, he decided to continue on his vacation to England. Uh, there is interpretation going on. Oh. They, they can't catch up with you. <laughs> Sorry, let me repeat. You're going too fast. In 1994, yes. I went with President Sadao Rajawara to OAU summit in Tunisia. After the summit, he decided to continue on his vacation to England. We all proceeded to England together with his guards. While on vacation, we normally heard rumors of coup. No one took it seriously due to the frequency of such rumors. I talked to Lantom Montamba. He informed me of such information, but he said to me they are working with NSS, National Security Service. Uh, so uh, your statement was signed by you this morning? Yes. And uh, in that statement, you said... No one took these rumors of coup seriously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was the attitude at the time. Uh, the previous ones, uh, yeah, okay, uh, maybe. Uh, that okay, was the anyway. attitude at the time. Yes, I would Not say. the new position you yeah. have just given us, that you, you take it seriously. Uh, I'll admit, since it's my statement, I wouldn't want to change it in the middle of the... Uh, good. Yeah. Uh, so, so let us proceed. You did not take this issue of coup seriously. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was a dereliction of duty by your admission. Uh, you did not inform the then president. Uh, you thought that was not important. Uh, 
What happened after that? Then we returned on the 21st, on a Thursday. And when we arrived, uh, we, this was a guard of honor. And then the, the protocols were accorded to the president. And then we took off for State House. And then I drove with the commander then on the ground, Sassosla Lanto Montamba, who was then in charge. And he informed me that uh, prior to our arrival, uh, some officers were disarmed uh, by the high uh, army command um, because of the, uh, the Kurumo. Did he tell you which officers were disarmed? Uh, specifically, Ayame was mentioned. Say that again? Yeah, Ayame, the then president, he was head of the military police. Was mentioned? Yes. As the person who was what? Disarmed, whose weapon, weapon uh, pistol was taken from him. Were you surprised to hear that? Yes, I was. So what was not taken seriously before you arrived, uh, did you take it differently this time around? Very well. And what did you do with the information you received? Uh, the information had already... Uh, what I did with the information, I, as soon as we arrived, even before I arrived, the... Uh, the officer in charge, Lantomo, has already taken the necessary uh, security precautions. And then the guards were reinforced. And then when we arrived at the state house, he had already, you know, before the security, and then he even he agreed that he spent the night with the men on the ground. You, did you inform the president? No, I didn't inform him, but I knew that he was informed. You knew he was informed? Yes, when we arrived, I knew he was informed. Who informed him? I knew the, uh, the, the director general of NSS had informed him. How do you know that? I spoke to him, the NSS director general, when he arrived at State House. But Jawara said in his book he never knew about this. He was only briefed the next day when another coup was in the making. With all due respect to him, and I read the book years ago, but this is my position. It is your position that what he said is not correct? With all respect, yeah. That's a bold one. Yeah, but I'm on the oath. I would leave it at that. Uh, let's move on. Uh, so tell us about the events of the next day. Uh, the next day when, as usual, I reported to work around 7, 7.30. I can't remember the exact period, uh, exact time, I would say. And then, the, as I said, the guards were on alert for what we call standby. And then I was in my office uh, waiting for... You said the guards were on alert. Or, yeah. They were on standby. Over the night, yeah. What was the state of security at at the State House. We know you did say they were on alert. Yeah. Uh, they were on standby. <coughs> but was the security reinforced? Not from without, but from within. From, from within, our own, the personnel of the presidential guards. How about the weapons? No, the limited weapons we had, we had only one that we, had, we, 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 we made so use of. It. You, you, you cannot reinforce security simply by adding more men if you do not have weapons? Yes, we have weapons. We have an armory. As uh, modest as it is, it was. You don't, use every, you don't de deploy it every day. So we had brought in more, uh, mainly ammunition. Uh, and then more people were given arms. We so have received testimony that the amount of weapons or the type of weapons you had at State House were definitely not sufficient to protect the place? Uh, it comes, I'm in a very good position to say that, to confirm that. I leave that, and it was not correct at the time. And we made every attempt uh, to request for more arms so that at least we could also have uh, sufficient weapons uh, to be able to, to protect uh, the president and his wife and the premises. Uh, at least so, for so you are agreeing with the proposition that uh, there were not sufficient weapons to protect State House? Certainly, certainly, 100%. But 
And when you reported to work that morning, this fact was not lost to you. Yes. You that you did not have sufficient weapons to yes. protect State House. It was not. It was not. Uh, did you ask for reinforcement of State House security for that day? No, not directly, no. But we had a parent uh, body, that's the TSG, which is the Fajara Barracks, that we are just a subunit of that. And probably naturally, are the ones who give it sort of a backup. And these are, this, these are the, the, uh, the, the units together with uh, some elements of the police that were deployed when the action proper started. So the question is, did you call for reinforcement of the security of State House on that day, knowing fully well that you have heard rumors of coup? The day before, Yaya Jami had been disarmed at the airport. So the, po the possibility of a school still happening was there. The question is, did you take extra precautionary measure by asking for security for State House? No, I didn't do that. Okay, thank you. So when you went to work that day, uh, what happened? As I said, uh, the routine was to, uh, to wait for the president to get ready to go to the office. And uh, normally, as the commander, I, I'll be in my office. The ADC will go to the president's room and just hang around the corridors when the president's ready with uh, some bodyguards. And then, you know, I'll be alerted that the, the president is coming down. Then we go and then receive him from the foot of the building and escort him up to his office. When he resumes his seat, then we, you know, withdraw and go to our normal business uh, of duties, rather, when the plain close security and some physical guards will be around. So I was my, in my office waiting for such a thing to happen. And then we, uh, for the routine, and I, then this information came that there were some you know, movements at Fajara, uh, sorry, at Union Barracks. So soldiers have seized the armory and they have, uh, you know, um, boarding trucks and vehicles heading to Banjul, towards Banjul. And then you all realize then the, the rumor is no longer a rumor. There is some action. That's what it was. Because when I heard about it, I knew. I said maybe that's the reason. So we're trying to do some tele uh, telephone con calls and find out what was happening. <laughs> Slowly, Mr. Valle. Sorry. Uh, and then the, the rest is there. No one, and then, we, as I said, we again, within our, uh, within our available means in terms of personnel and uh, weapons, and then we, we, we did little, uh, more extra reinforcements within the State House. Did this really happen, what you've just said? Yes. The surprise I have is that it's not in your statement. Mm. Yeah, okay, maybe it is too, <laughs> the, I, I, had, I, was, I didn't write a statement, I, I was recorded verbally, maybe if the certain specific things are asked. Mr. Bajo, don't yeah. blame it on the statement. No, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Uh, I they wouldn't. write what yeah. you told them. I wouldn't, and I wouldn't. You, 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 you've seen your statement several times. Yeah, even this morning uh, now. In fact, this morning you saw your statement and yes. you even made changes to it this morning. Yes, yeah. So the, the, the reason why I raise this is there is no other witness who testified on this particular subject who mentioned this. Sorry, may I ask you specifically? The reinforcement of State House after you heard that soldiers have taken over Fajara Barracks? No, I said within our available, available means from within, the men and, and personnel. This is an operational matter. So yes, it's, it's not from any reinforcement from outside, from, from within. Uh, uh, we even from within. Sorry? From within State House. Yeah. There was no step taken to reinforce the security of State House on that day. That is not true, Council. Not only are you saying it for the first time, because it's not in your statement. Yeah. Uh, your statement states, and and uh, I, I, I would I would read it out so, uh, so that. Uh, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you may follow the statement 
uh, paragraph 11. It states I, as follows, quote, the next morning, the 22nd July, I reported to work as usual. I was all, I was all alone in my office. There's a, there's, a, there's a mistake there, it all says along, along but uh, it, would definite, it would surely be alone. I was all alone in my office when I got the information from my orderly that the old pa, that is the president, Sadar Dajara, has already left the state house in a vehicle. I stepped out of my office and boarded the vehicle and asked the driver, uh, Jere Babojang, to follow them. We arrived at the port and then Sadauda and his family all boarded the ship. Upon boarding the ship, Sadauda asked me the whereabouts of the IGP, Press Jang. I went to fetch him at the police headquarters. On arrival there, I met AIG Chongan coming from the bridge. Uh, there it was confirmed to us that Yajame was leading the coup. I then went with the Inspector General of Police to the ship. Uh, obviously, this is a very summarized uh, statement of your activities that day. But what emerges from this is immediately you heard that Sadauda has left State House. You also left, correct? Yes, I had to, uh, to see how he was doing. Yeah, I did. <coughs> so, so this issue of reinforcing State House and all that really didn't occur? No, maybe maybe uh, if I will permit it. Maybe, I don't know, it's, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't blame anybody. Uh, what is been written is a true reflection of what I've said. But maybe at the time of saying it, uh, I had missed some key things. I don't want to blame anybody. I'll take responsibility, but I can if I'm allowed to dilate more on that day. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, I, I, I would wish to be very fair to you. Uh, if you must do that, by all means, yeah. do it. Uh, but uh, it's an unnecessary digression from the main issues. I, we just want to have a good sense of what happened that day. We are not looking to blame anybody. For, 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 for that. But we just want to know the attitude with which things you are taking that day and what really happened. Uh, so, but if you want to give that explanation, by all means do it. I just don't want us to be, to be bogged down on that particular okay. point. So I leave it to you. Do you want to talk more about yeah. it or you want to... I would certainly to want to. Please go ahead. Because I think the issue of... Uh, the inf news or the information that is uh, soldiers had broken barracks and things were happening, uh, the natural thing for anybody would have been, this is a routine to whatever you know, disposition you have taken would have been reinforced. Uh, whether it appears here or not, but I want to state that it happened. And then and then when I went to follow the president and the entourage at the at the, at, the, at the boat or the ship, I returned back to my office. I returned to office, my office rather. Then where I stayed with the men, and then as I said, we are anticipating, we did, we did uh, you know, uh, all what we are supposed to do. It was after a while again, I said, let me go and see how the old man and the family are doing the boat. This is my second trip. Maybe I, I, have, I have to apologize if maybe I didn't put that here. My second trip to the boat, that was the times the old Sadawada asked me about the IG. Then I went for the IG, then we came in, and then uh, we asked him what was happening. The IG had to brief him that we have taken the, the, the necessary dispositions. We have soldiers trying to, to uh, the, 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 the police, the TSG are trying to uh, stop them. Then he asked him to go back and take care of the situation. Then we all want to come back again. It was the time that we realized that the, the boat had, or the ship had left uh, the wharf a few meters. And this was a very... Uh, difficult moment for all of us, and I was said in my in my in my in my statement, uh, Pajala was uh, Pasala was about to take the risk of in, he thought he could even jump and land on, and he was restrained by the the, the officers. So, but uh, maybe out of whatever, I, I I missed that bit in my statement, but, but I want to put it on record. We would come back to that, uh, but I take it that your explanation is 
that uh, you did not stay away when you first went to the boat. You came back to State House and you did some work with your colleagues. Yeah. And you went back to the boat a second time. Yes. Right? Exactly. That's your explanation. Exactly. So when you returned to State House, you did some work regarding reinforcing State House and mm -hmm. so forth. That's what you did, right? Yeah, so to maintain, well, yeah, that's right, that's right. That's and, right. and how was the reinforcement done? No, it's, it's pretty, anyway, we already have uh, redeployed the men, deployed the men rather, give them the necessary, uh, the necessary weapons that we had, and uh, it's, it's, to, it's to, to wait and see what's going to happen. That's all. What I am trying to get from you is, how did you reinforce the place? What did you do to reinforce the place? No, as I mentioned, the reinforcement was done much earlier. With the, in terms of personnel and the weapons within our uh, within our means at the time, put more on, on the more people on sentry, giving them more ammunition, depending on what we have, because normally we have they will have only one one magazine with a, with, a, with, with, a, with a, an AK-47. But we had to go and bring more more ammunition and give some two uh, one or two extra uh, ammunition and put in uh, men at locations where ordinarily they wouldn't have been to take certain positions. Was that really done? Sorry. Was that really done? Yes, it was done. The surprising thing is that we have heard from several other people who were at State House. Mm. We have heard from ADC Gasama. Mm -hmm. We have heard from. Uh, Dembanjai. Mm -hmm. We have heard from Ture. Mm -hmm. Nobody mentioned seeing anything like what you have described mm -hmm. taking place at State House on that day. Yeah, except for Tian Ture, maybe he, he is the one who, because Tian was a plain clothes officer. He was already where he was supposed to be. Kasama was ADC. He was closer to the president. Dembanja was not on the ground that day. He fell sick. When we returned, I asked him to take rest and, and, and relax in the house because he left the, uh, the hospital straight to the... To, to we understand yes. all that. We understand all that. But nonetheless, you have two people who mm -hmm. were at State House mm -hmm. and have testified here, and none of them mentioned what you have just said about reinforcing State House. In fact... Uh, According to the testimony of Gassama, he was so concerned about the situation mm -hmm. and he claimed that he spoke to you mm -hmm. about the situation and you responded that you are monitoring it, you are monitoring the situation. Mm -hmm. That was not true. I didn't talk to Gassama on that day. In fact, when the president was being evacuated, as a commander, I was not even aware. I was not even aware. I was in my office waiting for the routine. I didn't would love surprise anybody. That at the command that the arrangements were made, he went to he heard about it. he went to the president, claiming that he met with well what happened. I listened to his testimony, but now, if he's saying that he talked to me about this, and when I did not even see him that morning, because he was closer to the president, whatever he was doing there as he narrated, whilst I was on my side in my office coordinating the security, then I, I, I can flatly say that what he said was not true among other things. But uh, the thing, though, is how could you be coordinating security when you are, in fact, not aware <coughs> of what was going on? Because that we, that's what you just said. When the president was being taken away, you were not even aware. Yeah, yeah that's, but I, that was not my, I was not on the ground at that place, but I was within. My responsibility with, under the circumstances <laughs> was the, is the command, the man I had my, under my command. Then that issue has been, I would have tough if things were, if he has the opportunity uh, to, for them to exploit the president being taken to the ship as a commander uh, who has the ultimate responsibility of the president's security would have been put in the picture data. But that was never done. So, so you were never aware never. that the president whose, I mean, your principal responsibility was to protect him. But you were not even aware that he was being taken out of the state house. No. I was never. Isn't that a serious failure? No, it's not my failure. It, I was, I would have said, as a betrayal on my side. No, no. The president could have been kidnapped and taken away 
and you wouldn't be protecting him. No, but I'm, I'm not directly responsible. Are people who are doing that job, as a commander, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't sleep at his doorstep. I men, and these are the plain clothes, children and others, who are in office, who are the people who are the, 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 the primary people uh, closer to him than the commander himself. Your men failed, correct? In informing me? Yes. They wouldn't know. It's Kasama who took charge of the responsibility, I would say, and that was not his job. No, what I'm trying to say here is that the pre I mean, here is the president of <coughs> the state. He was being whisked out of state house. Sir. And the commander of the presidential guards is not even aware of it. Is that normal? It's very abnormal. As I said, it's Isn't a betrayal. Isn't that a failure? No, it's not a failure. I've been betrayed. I didn't fail. No, what I am saying here is there's a failure of the system that you put in place. Not, not my system. It's a, it's, it's but but <laughs> as commander of the presidential guard, you are responsible for the arrangements of the security at State House, correct? Yes. That security had been breached by the president being whisked away without even your knowledge, correct? Yes. And that breach was a failure of the system that you had in place at the time. Let's move on. <laughs> we leave that point. Uh, we received testimony from Mr. Gasama that he was so concerned <coughs> as to the poor security of State House that he had to ask Samsidin Sar to go to the Marine unit to see if weapons could be brought from the unit to reinforce State House. What do you say to that? It is news to me. It's news he never, he never did, told me. Did that. it occur to you as commander of the presidential guards that that was a possibility for the purposes of obtaining weapons? I wouldn't know what the, the Marine had because I was not from the main army. He is from there, he knows what they had. And only the, the, the efforts we made was when we learned of the arrival of some heavy weapons uh, from, to, from China, specifically at the time, uh, as alluded to by some uh, previous uh, witnesses, I personally could even recall speaking to the then army commander, uh, requesting the same, uh, but it was not granted. All what we are asked to do was that <laughs> the, your, 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 the, 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 the territorial integrity of the defense of the country is not in your hands as our response to the army. If anything uh, happens, then the army will, 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 will take care. So they felt it was not necessary for us to have any extra weapons at the state house. Did and we couldn't do anything about it. Did you inform the president? No, I, would, I, would, I did not. Was that not important for him to... For, you, for him to know? No, for me, no. At the time, no. This is about his own security and the security of his family. Uh, you thought that you didn't have sufficient weapons to assure his security. You have tried to get the weapons. You were rebuffed. You did not think it was important to inform him? No. Big. Thank you very much. So uh, we move on. So on that day, you were informed that the president has been taken to the boat and you decided to go to the boat. Um, tell us what happened after that and uh, let's make this, let's take it quickly because you've already alluded to it. Yes, as I said, when we arrived, we had already bought it because I came late, late. And I went to see them until they settled down. And I came back to the office. And after a while, and I told uh, uh, General Lieutenant Tamba then that let me go back to the boat and see. Let's put this, <coughs> let's situate it in terms of time. What time did you go to the boat for the first time? I'll have to apologize. I'm not very good at that. I would say it was still in the morning. But I don't want to speculate the time, honestly. Well, uh, but this is important. It's important. <coughs> it you don't have to be specific. Mm -hmm. 
Just give us approximations. Uh, it could be around be, uh, between 8 and 9, and uh, around 9 o'clock or 9.30. 9.30 would be. So at what time did you return to State House? Uh, I didn't spend 30 minutes uh, in between. I didn't stay there long. I would say by, by 10, I was in back to State House. By 10, you were back at State House? Yes, if I want to. And uh, how did you spend your time while at State House? Monitoring the situation, as we've already taken the necessary dispositions. Monitoring the situation. And with whom were you working at the time? I had my deputy, uh, who was on the ground. That would be Lang Tong Bong Tabang. Yes, and then the, the, we were also communicating with the commander of the TSG, and that was uh, Major Tru Jaune, who was our overall boss at the time. Okay. And uh, what time did you leave the State House to go back to the boat? Now that, that would be around 11, 11.30. <coughs> and uh, it was that time you were asked to go to fetch P.S. Jang, correct? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So can you take your story from there? Yeah, when we, as I said, when we came back, when we came to the board with P.S. Uh, Jang, and then uh, we, after the president inquired from him, he got a briefing from him, and then he asked him, okay, go back and take care of the situation. And then uh, the, 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 we, we, as I said, we all came out from the president's uh, room with intention of coming out of the boat, only to realize that the, the boat was already uh, left. We tried. We negotiated so that they could allow us to, to get out, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept that. Because and, they said and what time was that? That will not because we didn't stay there long, that, uh, long with the president. We went in, we barely spent 10 minutes with him, and then we left. Maybe this will be before 12 for sure, after 11 or so. Uh, so, your <coughs> testimony is that by noon, the boat had already left the port and is sailing away. Yeah, I would have guessed the time. Yeah, because honestly, I don't want to specific with time, but I just my assumption. Yeah. At this time, did you have an idea or any idea where the soldiers were, the soldiers, the coupists, pretty much? At that time, no. But it was after a while that I was able to talk, talk to uh, Lantombo on the ground by telephone, and they informed me that he, they were around Gambia High School, I think, Gambia High School, this, yeah, around Gambia High. Uh, I know you have difficulty with time. But the testimony we received seems to suggest that the boat left port a whole lot later than the time you're suggesting. But let me give you this proposition. Okay. Uh, we've been told that uh, Pasala Jain and the National Security Advisor and the Permanent Secretary uh, Ministry of Defense were asked by Sadauda to go and negotiate with the coupist, and that occurred in the afternoon of that day. What do you say to that? I can't remember that. The only meeting I remembered was when I went with Pasala Chai, I went with him alone, and then this, as I narrated, he briefly present, and the president asked, asked him to go and take care of the situation that I could remember. Uh, when did that occur? Was it that time in the morning when Major Chongan or Lieutenant Colonel Chongan at the time returned to the police station from the bridge? Was it that time or was it a later time? It was after because I, when, I, when I went to fetch the IGP, that was the time I met the, uh, the DIG Chongan there. Then it was there, we went to the, to, to the boat together with the, with, the, with, the, with the IGP. But by Chongan's testimony, that would be in the morning? Yeah, anyway, so maybe he has a better memory in terms of time than me. Uh, but as I said, I have to confess, I've given you my difficulty in remembering specific times at the time. But what's important is the sequence of the, of the issues. <coughs> OK. 
Okay. So the boat left and uh, take your story. Proceed yes. from there. Okay. We tried everything possible, especially myself and uh, uh, Pasala Jain. Really, I could see, you know, we did everything possible. We appealed to the American ambassador, uh, Mr. Winter, who was there. And then we are assured that uh, they will make arrangements for the ambassador himself to come down the boat later and they will see what they can do for us. And then... Uh, but uh, what were you appealing for? To be able to, to get out of the boat, to come down. Or you did not want to go with the boat? Never, never. never. You wanted to come back? Yes, so. Right. And uh, was that possible? Unfortunately, no. So you reluctantly went with the boat? Very reluctantly. But at this stage, why very reluctantly? Yeah, because I know I have a responsibility. I have people who are serving under my command. And I would have really, uh, I felt that I would not have done um, them justice if I should leave them without my command. Whatever would happen, I should be there with them. But was in protection of the president also your responsibility? Yeah, but thank God that was found on a silver platter. Wasn't it the case, uh, sir, that you wanted to remain behind and participate in the coup? Never. Never. Wasn't it, in fact, the case that you were aware of the coup beforehand? Never. Never. So, very well. So, um, the boat left and uh, you reluctantly stayed on board. What happened afterwards? And as I said later, when I had access to telephone from the boat itself, I called the office, uh, my former office then. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, Lantomo picked the phone and I asked him about the situation. He briefed me. Then, you know, the, that the... What did he say? He told that he got information that the the, the soldiers were almost around Gambia High School, and they were very high, heavily armed. And did you give any instructions? Yeah, I told him try to try to make sure he did everything possible to go and negotiate with them, talk to them, so that you know they can you know you, you, they, they, to avoid any bloodbath, because you know what you have and what they have. So try to do everything possible to to avoid a bloodbath. That's that's my instruction I gave to him. To ask him to fold. Sorry? You asked him to fold? Uh, maybe not. Maybe yes. Maybe yes. You asked him to fold? No. And fold he did. He gave up State House, didn't he? Yes. On your instructions? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so you went with Jawara. The boat did not return. So what happened after you spoke to Lang Tombo? And then uh, we remained in the boat. <coughs> and then later in the evening when the American ambassador was being, you know, taken out of the boat by the, one of those small uh, uh, boats, uh, the dinghies, we tried myself and Pastor Jain to be given the opportunity to come down, but they wouldn't. They said, no, it was not safe. I said, but we asked, but why? If it is safe for the ambassador to come down, why not us? And we can easily find a way, but they insist and they refuse. So we remain there helplessly. And then, uh, as, uh, the rest is story. We, the boat landed in in in, in Dakar. Uh, I think it was a Sunday evening. And then we were received by the Senate. But in the during in the boat also there were some negotiations uh, that were happening, uh, of uh, of which uh, some of which I was privy, uh, like the uh, negotiations with the Senegalese government. To, to accord, uh, um, uh, to grant a side order to allow him and enter to go to Senegal. Uh, it was very difficult because initially, the, in fact, uh, President of Juf could not be reached. Uh, Jawara tried. Um, he was tried. They tried everything possible. The American ambassador had to talk to the State Department. Uh, and I remember in those days, the Deputy uh, Secretary of State. Uh, for African Affairs was uh, Mr. Moose, I think it's George Moose, I could remember the date, uh, because this was communication was done by the 
on through the radio communication of the of the boat and then we are in the room control room and you could hear and he said he was able to rick president juf apparently president juf had already moved to popongil that is his uh, uh, retreat house somewhere outside of dakar uh, but the only thing they could convince him to do was to accept jawara on humanitarian grounds uh, but they would not intervene militarily to save the situation and there was no choice this already uh, Saddam had already spoken uh, to, the, to, to the soldiers through Lieutenant Edward Sengate and, and then when he was offered to come back to the country uh, where he would accorded this position of status of a senior statesman he can even serve as an advisor to the new government and Saddam said no he wouldn't accept that the only thing he could ask them was for them to go back to barracks and then come back if they had any grievances and that would be looked into and then that negotiation didn't, didn't, didn't yield results and then they parted then now the only hope was to go to Senegal uh, and uh, with all this effort I uh, went to Senegal we landed we were received at the airport by Senegalese some officials and then we are driven to residence Medina where we are lodged and um, for how long <coughs> did you remain at residence Medina me this was 22nd july i think i came back around the 30th if you will allow me to, to refer to a note uh, by all means Sorry. go ahead i think it was the 30th let me just cross to the note here on the 30th july exactly that's the note you prepared for yourself no right? it's a particular date that i want to I, I, don't I, That's I was right. lucky to. All right. So, so you returned on the 30th. Yeah. How did it happen uh, that you were able to return? Yes, because what happened when we arrived there, there was this hope that there would be some assistance to be able to to bring back the president, especially from the Nigerians. At this stage, the coup had already succeeded. Uh, yes, after two days, uh, yes, in, uh, in a nutshell. And during this period have you spoken to any of the people on the ground in gambia never the last time i spoke the only person i spoke to was was lantom montamba my deputy before we lost any communication i didn't speak to, speak to anybody but uh, from the news you were receiving <coughs> it was obvious that the coup has already succeeded yes yes we are all clued to our radios the bbc and others and uh, all right so on 30 june 30 july Tell us what happened. Yeah, before 30 July, uh, uh, maybe, as I said, maybe my statement is not that detailed enough. Uh, before 30 July, we were there because the, there, were two, uh, there were two possibilities at the time. Uh, so while efforts were being made uh, to, have, to, and would to secure international support, mainly from the Nigerians, uh, who then had the ultimate responsibility of, 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 of uh, commanding the Gambia Army, uh, so they will, maybe they will come and help. And then the other thing was Sadada's own family, mainly the children also, uh, had a meeting, uh, those who were around, uh, that they uh, tried to convince him to consider the, the offer that he come back since, you know, he will not be harmed, you know, and then he will be given the status. And this, he said really he couldn't, he couldn't take that uh, as it was. And then he will also have to consult with his, uh, uh, his, his colleagues, his, uh, some of his uh, people around him, and then we are all hoping, and we'll think about it and consult. So we are all hoping that maybe there will be a positive reaction, uh, reply from him on that, oh, the Nigerians. But we got information that, he, that the Nigerian foreign minister was in, on his way. And all hopes were dust when he came and delivered the message that they would have loved to come and use military force to, to dislodge the junta. But they couldn't get clearance from the from the Senegalese government in either of the use of their land or airspace. And it would have been futile. They could not be able to come to Gambia as it is. They would not succeed. And these are the two things that really, uh, and then when Sadawda also, after reflection and suggestion from his family, uh, maybe after some consultations, also decided not to take that option of coming back as offered by the junta. Okay, then I've seen really uh, the uh, after one week, almost one week with him, with them there, 
and I still feel that responsibility of having men who are under my command, uh, who I could not have the opportunity of seeing through uh, to, to the end of the, of the episode. But I still and as, I will not abandon my country also as a soldier. Uh, I don't have any reason to stay uh, away in an uncertain situation. And during this period, did you speak to anybody? Except my family, I don't speak to anybody. Uh, did you speak to Lang Tombo? No, not in Dakar, no. Uh, it is suggested that your reasons for coming back uh, was that an arrangement was already negotiated for you. What do you say to that? I heard about it, but yes, that's not true. That's not true. You decided to take, to take the risk? Yes, the risk. To come as back? Yes, yeah, as it's worth it. Can you tell us what happened when you returned? Now, the eve of coming, I decided to come back. I met the president uh, and I told him, sir, uh, I want to take your permission. I want to go back. Now, he said, but is it safe for you, your security? I said, anyway, that's in the, in the hands of the Almighty God. But I'm a soldier. Uh, the job also demands the risk uh, that I can take the ultimate uh, um, uh, responsibility. You will go back. He said, okay, if you want to go to this problem. And then he took out 30,000 safer. He said, okay, we can use this as a fair. So and then I asked the boys, the, the guards, who were vol any volunteers to come back. Uh, only two of them volunteered. Uh, that is the lead, Fali Jabang, and uh, one Ansusayo. Then the following day, we took off early morning. We went to Pompier. We boarded the set plus. And we see, saw ourselves to, to, to Barra, then Banjul, uh, at Banjul uh, Terminal. Uh, we took a taxi. We got some dialysis on me. We took us to State House. And then when we arrived at Batty Flats, uh, my two junior colleagues were hesitant to go to State House. I told them, no, you have no responsibility. I'm the one who will answer. You are under my command. There's no problem because we cannot do otherwise. You cannot go and sneak into your houses. Then that will be a different thing. Let's go and face. So reluctantly, they, 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 they followed me. We went to State House. And then I asked... Uh, the soldiers, uh, especially some of the former uh, presidents of guards, my, some of them who are under me, uh, who was in charge. And they led me to my former office, where I found the late Vincent Jatta, who at the time was the commander. And I told him I'm back with two other uh, uh, officers. And he asked us to sit down, and he went up to the main building of the, of the State House, uh, where then I learned the council was having a meeting. And then he came back, he told us, uh, the chairman said, you people should give us your contact details and go to your respective houses, homes, and wait for further instructions. So when we came out, you know, we were wandering around the guard room to looking for means of transportation to take us home. Uh, fortunately, from Ansusayo and Fali all hail from Marakisa, which is very close to Brikama, and I'm from Brikama. So it, it happened that uh, Major Suare then, was about to go on a patrol. So I, I asked him if he could give us a leave. He said, why not? I said, how far? I said, no, we are going to just round in combos. We do uh, patrol. That's how we found ourselves. He gave us lift up to Brikama. The other two boys dropped around the market. I gave them fare to, take, uh, to proceed to their village. And I also went home. He dropped me at home. And uh, did anything happen while you were at home? While I was out home, it was uh, maybe a week or two weeks later, I can't remember the date, then I, I got a call to report to State House. Uh, this was uh, Demanjai, I think then he was the Chief of Staff, I cannot fully remember, he was Chief of Staff and Chief of Protocol. Then he asked me to come and answer. And then when I went in, he asked me the chairman wanted to see you. Uh, so when I went, he took me to the chairman's office, the then Vice Chairman uh, Sana was sitting down, and then we greeted, and they asked me to sit down. So the Yajame, in his own words, said, we know you are doing your job. Nobody will hold, hold you responsible for either going away or for, for the President to go away. You are doing your job. If any of us were in your position, this is what you would have done. But we all have responsibility to this country. 
and then we, we are considering to give you one of the positions as commissioner uh, to help us and uh, administration administering the one of the divisions and likely you might be appointed as commissioner to western division and how did you react i said yes uh, it's good that you understand you understand my my my, my, my plight I was, I was doing my job and then when it comes to national duty i will, I will, I will be available to serve my country uh, to so that we you know serve the people um, do you know Bit you and Pasala Jain, who returned to Gambia first? Pasala Jain, much earlier. Pasala, I think we arrived that very night he left. And do you know what happened to him? No, it was later that I knew that he was arrested. And what else, what else happened to him after his arrest? When he was arrested and taken to mile two. That's what I heard, yeah. So. If he was arrested and detained in mile two, right? Yes. And... Uh, wasn't that the modus operandi that senior officers were arrested and detained? Yeah, most of them were arrested, so. And detained? Yes. You could have suffered a similar fate. I was expecting more, expecting more. Worse than that. You were expecting worse than that? Yes, sure. Worse than that did not happen to you? Yes. In fact, you were rewarded. Okay, maybe rewarded. <laughs> I don't think rewarded. <laughs> it was, it's but you not were, a personal offer. You were elevated to, you were received and embraced, correct? I was received and then given a task. Uh, and uh, you did not suffer the fate of similar fate with others. You were promoted to a higher position. Yes. <coughs> and given responsibility. Mm -hmm of one of the biggest regions in the country yes to administer yes that's a huge promotion <coughs> wasn't it yes it was a favor no i wouldn't take it as a favor of course it was no, a favor it wasn't would you have been commissioner if it was not for your ajami it's possible that's destiny uh, yes, anything <laughs> is possible. Could have been, could have anything happened. is possible. Anything is possible, yeah. But uh, what was the likelihood that you would ever be commissioner during that time if Yaya Jame did not accord you that privilege? No, minimal, but it's, imp it's not impossible to. Yes, anything is possible. But yeah. what, is, what, <coughs> what was the likelihood that that would happen? The chances would, as a human, would be slim. Very slim. Yeah, I would say, but it's not impossible. To. We could say non-existent. <coughs> Sorry? Non-existent. Uh, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't agree to that. Uh, but you would definitely agree that that was a massive promotion. It was a promotion, yeah? A big one. Uh, okay, yes, I would, I would accept. Uh, so, so, yet again... Yaya Jame has come to your rescue. Mm -hmm. uh, not only did he spare you from jail, as yeah. he did your colleagues, mm -hmm. he did you a huge favor by promoting you and giving you one of the biggest responsibilities in uh, local government administration. Right? Yes. And uh, while you were there serving in Western Division. Uh, did you hear about events that happened in November 1994? Yes, I heard it. Tell us what happened. Not what I heard, maybe. <laughs> maybe what I heard, not what happened, but I was yes. there. T tell us what you know. Yeah, I heard uh, in the morning of uh, November 11, uh, uh, specifically I wouldn't know, because I don't want to mention names here, that might not be because I want to speculate, but I, if my memory will serve me well, it's that through my driver, who used to live in Yundum, not in the bar barracks, but in the, in the village, uh, would have told me in the morning that he got information that there were some shootings at Fajara barracks. But I stand to be corrected. I wouldn't want to implicate people here, mention their names of things that might not be true. But I got information that there was some move, uh, activities at the Fajara barracks overnight. But uh, 
without knowing the details, uh, we are, was lucky to have the announcement made by Sana Sabali uh, of the issue that happened. And what did you hear him say? Uh, what he said was there were some group of soldiers left, led by Left Number Baro who attempted to dislodge the junta or to uh, overthrow the junta. And uh, in the skirmishes, I, I don't remember the word exactly, but in the shootout, whatever, some soldiers, including Left Number lost their lives. Did you come down to see what was happening? No, I didn't. I didn't. Didn't it concern you to know what happened to your colleagues? Yeah, it would concern me, but <laughs> it was within my it was not within my my, my jurisdiction. Where, where would I go and find out? You are not interested to know what happened. Yeah, I, I would. I wouldn't be because I wouldn't know where to go. Where would I go and find out? Where would I go? I wouldn't. I didn't. You worked at Fajara Barracks before. Yes. Did you go to Fajara Barracks to see what was happening? No, there? no. <clears throat> you stayed away? Yes, I stayed away in my responsibility. And what happened to your career after that? After that, uh, sometime in, uh, it was in January, or okay, precisely when the Sana Sabali and the Sadi Haider were arrested, and accused of attempting to overthrow uh, the junta. And then I was called, uh, a few days later, I was called to report to State House. And I, when I went to State House, uh, I was whisked to the chairman's office again. And then, you know, we had the necessary uh, greetings here and there. And then he uh, gave me a, letter, a brown envelope, uh, which I opened, and uh, when I read, I've seen that he has uh, offered me uh, the position of Minister of the Interior and a member of the Armed Forces Ruling Council. And when I read it, and I, you know, I, 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 I thank him. I said, okay, thank you so much for the confidence, and I will also do my best. Uh, so you are now appointed minister? Yes. <coughs> but not only were you appointed minister, you were also made a member of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council. Yes. And that was... A very privileged position, limited to only three other people, Indeed. Or, or say five other people. Indeed, it was. Another huge favor. Favor, okay. <laughs> Take it as a favor, but I won't see it as a favor. <laughs> but because somebody has to do the job, it doesn't mean that whoever is given a position has been favored. Yes. Many people are appointed in within that period in and after. So if you want to assume all assignments as favors, then... Uh, Mr. Baja, you did not have to take an exam and, <laughs> and, and win that position, did you? No, not at all. Uh, you had to be selected arbitrarily yes. by somebody who had absolute discretion. Yes. And you were chosen out of the many others who are potentially more qualified. Certainly. That was a favor. Mm. I wouldn't agree with that one. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think... The conversation is interesting, but we have to take the coffee break. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council. We will take a 30-minute break and come back at 12 noon. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>